I'd like to welcome to the show Noam Crow, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Thank you, Alex. I'm excited to be here in video as well. So this is yes, great. Yes, video and audio. So for all of you listening, you can also watch the video on IFH TV uh, through the new uh, IFH TV video podcast. But enough about that. Uh, so I've always I, I had I had the pleasure of being on uh, Noam's uh, amazing podcast. Uh, a, a few months, what, six months ago, something like that? Something like that. Uh, something like that, yeah, five, six months ago. Right, and it was a great experience, and uh, he's an L.A. guy like me, so it's always nice to connect with other guys in town, and uh, and I wanted to have him on the show because he has a new movie, and how he made that movie is a very interesting story, so I wanted to talk about that. But first and foremost, Noam, how did you get into this ridiculous business we call the film industry? Well, I think... Um I always try to go back as many people do to like when you got in psychologically and sure. when did I actually get in. So psychologically, it's probably like you and like a lot of people. It was just always something that I did. Like as a kid, I was shooting movies and taking like all my school projects were taking my camcorder and making, you know, ridiculously offensive videos for my school projects and all of that. I, I did and, those too. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that was, you know, I, I think just getting a bit of a rush from like, oh, this is something I like doing. It's fun. It's creative and it entertains people. That kind of was the bug. But I really didn't realize it just never, you know, I grew up in Toronto and, and yes, there's a, a film industry there, but it's not like LA where like every, you know, you throw a stone and, and you hit like a producer, an actor, whatever. It's, it's, it still seems like this very like foreign thing. Uh, so I didn't really, it never like crossed my mind that I could actually make a living doing it. And I was also, you know, I always knew I was going to make films. I thought it'd be more of a passion thing on the side. And, uh, and I went to school, like I studied psychology while I was in university, uh, a friend of mine started a little production company just doing like local commercials and he brought me into it. And I was like essentially freelancing doing commercials and all of that, um, while I was doing short films and all this other stuff and like studying something totally unrelated in school. And, um, once I graduated, I just said, you know what, I'm going to just, I, this is really what I want to do. I'm going to. Um, take a risk. I'm going to rent an apartment that I literally don't know how I'm going to pay for at the end of this month. I'm going to go on Craigslist and find whatever freelance job will pay me, you know, 200 bucks to go and shoot some crappy commercial for mm -hmm. something that nobody's ever going to see. And I'm not above anything. I'm just starting and I just want to see if this is possible. And essentially, I just put one foot in front of the other and scaled that up and turned it into more of, of a, a professional system where I'm, you know, I, I'm also still to this day balancing making my own films and making commercial content, um, but not uh, scouring the Internet for work and having proper marketing systems in place and working with, you know, clients I really want to work with and projects I want to work with and making the films I want to make. So it's, it's still a learning process, but that was kind of the you know, the, 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 uh, inciting incident to use a screenwriting, <laughs> some screenwriting lingo. Um, if, if, uh, if that answers your question, hopefully. Sure. Um, and then, so well, you just finished doing a great, a new movie, which is amazing called shadows on the road. How did that come to be? And, and tell us a little bit about how you made that, you know, movie. It's a unique story. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, I'd, I'd made another feature. I call it a feature length film and not a feature film because I never released it. But when I was like 25, 26, um, I made uh, I wanted to make a feature and I did this micro budget film, um, which in many ways I'm very proud of. But it wasn't it, I didn't really know what I was doing yet. Um, and, I, you know, every every movie, you probably say that after you're done with it. But in this case, like I really hadn't gone to film school. I hadn't I learned everything on that movie. Um, and. I, at the same time, I, I was sort of soured from the experience in the sense that like, it wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. I didn't know how to market it. I didn't understand film festivals. I didn't even submit to most film festivals. Like it was just so daunting. And I took like, at the same time I was moving to LA and I had to make money because I, I, you know, I didn't know a single person here. And so like five years, four or five years of my life were basically dedicated to like, I got to move to a new country. I'm from Toronto. How do I do that? How do I keep making a living doing that? And I knew at some point I'd get back to making a feature 
But it wasn't until like two years ago that I finally said, you know what, I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been writing stuff that needs bigger budgets that I'm excited about, but like, I just can't get it done. Like, what can I do right now? And this was a total experiment where I literally, I went with my wife, she co-wrote it with me and we were having lunch and I, we were just saying, you know, what can we do literally in like two weeks? What can we shoot a month from now that we can write right now, not put pressure on it Mm -hmm. to be this like perfect thing. We're going to spend two years developing, like just let it be imperfect and let it be an experience and like let some magic happen within that. And that's what we did. Wrote uh, a concept literally like over lunch based on a theme. Um, You know, the, the film centers around Uh, a girl who is uh, a victim, essentially a victim of abuse. And uh, those details of that are revealed throughout the course of the the film. So I don't want to get too much into that for anyone that might watch it. But it it essentially deals with that theme. And it's, you know, something that is very, obviously right now, very relevant. And when we wrote and all this stuff happening with like me too or whatever wasn't mm-hmm. happening but it was still clearly like in the air that like there was a lot of these stories floating around and we were trying to figure out like how do we package that theme into a format that we can shoot for um what ended up being like twelve thousand dollars and i thought it was going to be even less but that was like us going over budget was like twelve thousand dollars um so how do we do that in you know like a week and a half with no money and like a two three person crew and we backed our creative idea into those parameters so we came up with a structure for the story the movie the logistics everything that would be feasible within our own means, um, which is, you know, what everybody preaches. Um, and it, for the most part, it worked. There were some rules I broke that definitely got us into trouble and caused me a, a ton of stress and, and, and pain throughout the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but it got done in the end and we released it. And, you know, I'm sure over the course of the conversation and, you know, ask me if there's any specifics you want me to get into, but, um, but there were, yeah, there's a lot of crazy stories in in both production and post, um, that I'm, I'm happy to dive into if, if that's, if that's where you want to go. Oh, no, no, absolutely. So, all right. So first of all, was this a SAG project? It was SAG. Yeah. It was uh, ultra low budget as so I'm Mm -hmm. sure, you know, but for listeners, that's like the, now they also have new media, which, Mm -hmm. um, which you can, sometimes people prefer that, but yeah, Mm -hmm. ultra low budget. So you're paying your actors like 125 a day. If they have an agent, it's like 135, 137. Yeah. So you pay, you're paying the agent the $10 because God knows (laughs) they need it. It's just like, it's so ridiculous. Go ahead. So no, so it was SAG and you know, it was only SAG because, um, part of the way that we can do it so quickly was it had to be written around people we knew. So there's two different actresses I'd worked with before, Mm -hmm. both really good. One was full SAG. She's been in movies that have gone to like South by Southwest Mm -hmm. and, and she's also a singer. So she, anyway, she's kind of in the, you know, she has, she has a lot of um, stuff going on and she's a full member and it was easier to just deal with SAG and hire her than it would have been to try to recast the whole, or like cast the whole thing from scratch and mm-hmm. find someone as good as her. Um, it was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, honestly, I don't love working with SAG. Mm-hmm. It, I'm doing it right now. It's not, mm-hmm. not the most fun thing to do, but it's a, a necessary evil, I guess, at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is. No question about it. Did your film, I know uh, I'll let you get back if you have a follow up, but did you do Meg on with SAG as yes. well? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It was, okay. it was a, yeah. same thing. SAG low, low, low um, okay. ultra low budget. Ultra low. Yeah. Cool. Kind of thing. So yeah. Cause we had a, a great cast. We were very blessed to have a really great, amazing cast. We were all very seasoned actors. Yes. Um, yeah. That's right. Without question. So, all right. So you, you gather the, this, uh, you gather this, Thing together um and you get the actors you're like okay uh i'm gonna go shoot this thing um i'm assuming the money came out of your own pocket yes yeah. okay so you guys put your money where your mouth is which is yep. which is good and then um how did you gather the crew and what made you decide what crew members were absolutely necessary for the process well that's a great question and that kind of led to like the very first issue that I had on set was <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm so used to doing so much myself. I've shot short films where I've been a one man crew and um 
I quickly realized on the future just because I can do that doesn't mean I should or that I'm going to be able to sustain that over a feature. Even if it's a seven day, 10 day, 12 day feature, um, it's a lot more than one day when you're doing it yourself and you can relax or two days or whatever on a short film. So originally it was supposed to be myself. Um, my wife who wrote it and was producing, she was going to be on set with us. Um, our sound, uh, recordist, Scott, who was there every day. And, um, and on some days, it, only some days when we need like special effects, makeup and makeup artists. And m more or less that was it. Like that was, it was literally like three of us. Um, and I got to day one and I started shooting. And just by the end of the day, I realized it, I needed to bring on someone to shoot because I couldn't. It was all handheld. I couldn't physically deal at the end of the 12 hour, 10 hour day, whatever it was the first day with like having this camera on my shoulder, trying to focus, trying to focus on mm -hmm. the story, the actors, like not having any AC, any grip, anyone else, like a PA even to just like take the camera in between takes, like didn't have any of that. So I just, I called um, a friend of mine who'd shot some low budget stuff with me before I said, can I call in a favor? You know, I don't have a lot of money, I'll throw you few bucks, whatever I can afford. Do you want to do a feature? I knew he wanted to do narrative. He came on board. So we ended up being, um, you know, a team on, on our biggest day of like maybe four instead of three or, or whatever, right. whatever right. that came out to be. Um, and that was it. And the next film, I, I, by the way, I don't advise that because I'm making, as you know, another feature right now. And I'm, I think for certain films you can do that and that's probably what you should do. Um, but you have to know if it's right for the film and, and the film, that film it, it, it worked for, but it was a struggle. It wasn't, I'm not going to paint a picture that like it was, yeah, you could make a movie with three people and it's easy. It's not easy as you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard and, uh, and, and it, 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 under certain circumstances it's really hard and maybe not even a good idea. So on my next film, I mean, we're still going to be a small crew, but, um, but we're going to have enough people there that, um, at least, uh, you know, the oper day to day operations are, are moving me, you know, wanting to, to blow my brains out at the end of every no, shooting day. No, I, I agree. So. I agree with you hundred percent. My first film I did that, I did the, um, I was the DP on and it was a yeah. shooter and that, and, and then I was like, you know, I don't want to do that again. My back, I, I hurt myself. I, there was physical damage to me, like just carrying yeah. that black magic rig on my shoulder. And, and it was like all this kind of, and I was out of, it was out of shape. I was just out of shape. Um, so then on the second film, I was able to do it. Uh, and I brought in my, my trusty DP Austin and he did a yeah. great job. But the thing I, I think everyone listening should really understand is that you said it was something very, very interesting. The parameters, the, is it right for the story? Is it correct mm -hmm. for the story? So both those movies, both my movies and your movies, you kind of try to build the crew. Is this right for this film? Is this camera the right camera for this film? Is mm -hmm. it? Do I need 30 people on set? Can I get away with three people? And will it do the story justice? If you're trying to do a huge action movie with three people, nah, that's not going to work. Exactly. It, it, yeah. It's, and even within the micro budget, I think if I can add to that, I think yeah. it's um, – like, OK, so my philosophy has always been there's these rules you have to follow as a micro budget filmmaker. But if you follow every single rule, you're going to wind up with the same movie that everybody else is making. And, and it may not be that great. It may be great. It may be great. And you can figure out some brilliant idea that works within those confines. But my philosophy has always been like, pick one or two rules that you're willing to break. And, and if it means extra work or extra sweat equity or money or whatever it takes, like break that rule to, to make it, if it's going to really count and if it's going to really make it special. So on this one, I broke the location rule of like, you know, everyone says shoot in one location or shoot in two or three locations. Like every single day we shot in a different location, none of which we had permits for. What? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. And it was the most, literally the most stressful experience oh. of my life. And I've had some pretty stressful experiences <laughs> in my life. And it was so insane to, to try to pull that off. Um, and in the end, I mean, I could look at it and say, okay, I'm, I'm, on one hand, I'm very happy because um, we had, you know, we shot in all these different locations. I feel like it added a lot of production value. And that was the goal from the beginning. Sure. Like, let's not just put this all in like one room, although that could be an amazing movie if it's written that way. Um, but let's like, it's a road movie. It's a, it's an experience. Let's like show the landscape. Let's drive up to the desert. Like let's just every day, you know, go somewhere else. 
And, um, and it was really that like compounded with all the other craziness. Like we had a van that literally broke down every day and that my DP, uh, when he was supposed to be filling it up with gas cause he was driving it, he put the gas in like the, the engine coolant <laughs> tank or the oh, water Jesus. tank or something. So we, like I, I was driving to, uh, just to go on a bit of a tangent, like I'm driving to set one day, which is the Google maps pin that I dropped in the middle of Palmdale that I, I sent everybody at like 3 AM the night before. Sure. And, um, and I just see the van we rented this like hippie VW, like, you know, right, hippie right. Van. And I see it pulled over on the highway and I'm like, oh God, that's not our, our van, is it? I see the DP like empty, like opening up this thing and gas coming out of the van on the, on the ground. And we're, uh. we're already like late to be shooting. And like, that was just <laughs> like one day, you know, so, <laughs> every day was that basically. So but, but, it, it was, it was crazy. But for me, like, I'll tell you though, like, you know, that, that thing you were saying that you made you so nervous and stressful, I found exhilarating. Like, yes. and maybe that's because I've got a few more years on you that I just found like, I don't care. You know, as you get older, you give less of a crap. Yeah. I mean, you just truly oh, yeah, give yeah, less yeah. of a crap as you get older. Um, so yeah. I was just like super excited. Just like, I'm, I don't have permission. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, no. And I hear you. And I'm normally like that. And, and I was like that for the first couple of days, but we got, I think it, part of it was like, we got kicked out of three different locations, uh, I think all within like the first two days of shooting oh. and like, and your we actors are missing. like, Oh God. <laughs> exactly. So my anxiety was less about like, I've, I've been kicked out of shooting places before sure. and, and it's usually, as you know, it's like, Hey, you're not supposed to be here. It's like, it's not that big of a deal, but at the same time, what I was getting anxious about is like, uh, okay, I'm paying everybody for these days. There's not a lot of people. The actors only have a little window to do this. If we don't get the, these scenes that are really important for the movie, like, I'm getting anxiety that like can we even like make this movie can we put together one of the most important like scenes in the first act is when the two girls the two main characters meet each other and we were shooting it on venice beach and i i had like you know at least three hours four hours mentally blocked off for that scene um within five minutes of shooting it the security guard came up and i i like begged him like can we just have literally five minutes and on the fly we had to think like okay what do we rewrite now how do we rework this so you were no you were trying to shoot on venice beach yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah dude you're yeah. like you're rolling hard man that's that's a tough place oh, yeah. to shoot <laughs> oh yeah especially with like we had like a full you know like uh, yeah you have a full black uh, magic i mean rig. yeah in full yeah full rig and like audio which is really what gives it away you have someone with like a giant boom pole and all that and it was just you know it was a risk i was willing to take and uh i took it and we got the shots we needed but yeah the scenes that should have been like four hour scenes we had to all of a sudden like turn a dialogue scene into like uh, a visual exchange that's going to happen over five minutes of shooting time it was having to deal with that stuff that was getting getting stressful um but but yeah i mean there were definitely good days too it wasn't all crazy but it it, it took its toll for sure so, on, on me and, and the crew i'm sure so let me so you shot the whole thing in 12 days right um, yes. So it was 12 days. And I, th I think we did like two or three pickup days, mm -hmm. um, two of which like I just cut out of the movie. So they were total wasted days. Nice. Um, and one of which was basically me driving around by myself with a camera, like sure. getting, yeah, you know, stuff, stuff. Yeah. yeah exactly. So can you please tell the audience? Cause I think this is something that directors and filmmakers don't really realize, especially us lazy, um, filmmakers uh, and out of shape filmmakers that this is a physical game uh, to yes. do this. This is not Peter Jackson shooting Lord of the Rings with a with a recliner, a lazy boy on set like he did. <laughs> Literally had a lazy boy on set, and they would like PAs would carry the lazy boy from place to place, and he would just sit down and go to Vili Vi Video Village. That's not this. So a lot of filmmakers don't understand that when they go down this road, how physically grueling it's going to yes. be. Uh, can you please yeah. just tell a little, talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could add a lot to that conversation because it was in this film in particular. That's I, I agree with that a hundred percent, and that's true of I think like every film on this scale I've ever worked on. But this one in particular was so grueling that it literally took me um, the better part of a year to to physically recover. I got sick. I literally developed like um, I, I I was sick on and off for six months. 
I was like going to the doctor, my skin was messed up, I was going to the dermatologist. We're shooting in like freezing cold weather <laughs> with no sleep all day. Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah. was going to like the, these like sweat, like in Hollywood, they have like these sweat, sweat lodges. Shop. Yeah, yeah sweat lodges. Like, with yeah. my wife and like sweating like a pig. And I'm like, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. And then the next day I'm like vomiting. <laughs> like literally my body, my immune system was completely destroyed. I, I was more sick than I've ever been in my life. I'm actually going to do a... Uh, an article at some point on my website about like just the toll it took and and I couldn't write it until now because honestly it was like psychologically damaging and and I, I was like how could I ever do this again and and you know that's why on on the, the next film you know I've, I've put all of these measures in place because I know how hard it is um, putting so much more time into prep putting so much more time into just making sure that the team that's on board is going to be able to um, make it, you know, it's, it's still going to be really hard. I don't doubt that, but like just some of the contingencies I can put in place to like not get to that point. Um, like it's, it, it was no joke. Like if I did another film like that, I literally think it would, it would actually kill me. Like it, it, it's, <laughs> I think you've it's, now, yeah. you've purposely, you've, you've absolutely scared the hell out of the audience. <laughs> you've, <laughs> You've told, like, and I had hives, and I my arm literally fell off. I had to attach it again. It's like <laughs> I'm not joking. It wasn't that far off. And and I again, I don't mean to say everything's going to be like that, but it literally in my case on this film it was. And it, and I'll blame myself for the way it was scheduled, sure, the lack sure. of pre production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pre production was the main thing because like there were days where you know I didn't where because it was all guerrilla. Um, you know, I had an idea, maybe we're going to shoot somewhere I found on Google Maps and I drive there the day before to scout it. And now there's construction there. And then we have to shoot later that night. And then it's three in the morning and I just got home. I don't know where we're filming the next day. And like, I'm up all night trying to put a call sheet together because there's no AD. So it's just like, if you don't want to, you know, destroy yourself making a film, yeah. I think the key is, is just know what what you cannot handle at least try to predict that and then if it's money well spent like we all want to do things as cheaply as possible and that's great but like in retrospect like i would have way rather put a couple of thousand bucks on a credit card and had one or two more people involved that could have lightened the load a little bit so mm -hmm. it's not always necessary but you know, again, this wasn't a film where we're shooting it in one house with two actors having a conversation. If it was that, then that's, you know, a piece of cake in, in, in physically maybe, right. but it oh, no, wasn't I'll, that. I'll tell you what, and this will be the last thing we'll do to scare the hell out of everybody listening. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on my first film, This Is Meg, um, I had this rig that I, I built out to carry the, this, it was, it was a ridiculously big rig, um, for the camera. It was, I was shot through the 2.5 K, uh, black magic cinema camera. So I'm, I'm, I'm carrying this rig. Right. And then afterwards I develop a trigger finger on my, on my hand because I was gripping it the wrong way. I just had surgery. This is two and a half years later. I had surgery on my hand. Like, oh my God. like literally a month ago. So like I can't from that same from it just the, never went and went. Is it better now or is oh it no it's, no no the trigger's gone. But now I'm like I'm in therapy. Yeah. I'm in like physical therapy trying to fix my yeah. fix my finger to kind of close. You know I, I have perfect grip. I can grab. I can do everything. But like if I go too cl like I close too much, it hurts because yes. I'm, I'm still healing. I'm literally like four or five weeks out of the surgery. But I literally wow. had surgery because of that. So that's why the second movie I was like. Austin, just you carry the camera. Yeah, I can't. I'm not. Exactly. I'm not. I'm not. Well, because you live and learn. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think people are so gung ho to just say. And and I'm of this camp. Like I preach this on my blog and and everything every week. But it's like just you know take a punk rock attitude. Just make the movie. Do whatever you have to do to make the movie. Like no one's gonna make it for you. And all of that's true. But at the same time, I think you have to think of it as like a long term career in the sense like you're you're gonna make a lot of movies and you know don't. Right do something that is going to like, don't, don't mess up your back so badly that like you, you can't make another movie for another two years or whatever it may be. Like, you know, you have to pace yourself, but, um, anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I hope, hopefully nobody's too freaked out. I do want to reiterate that a lot of it was, <laughs> was, it was so much just a, a personal, like just choices I shouldn't have made yes, that I exactly. did make, you know, exactly. but, um, but I think there's a version of that film that could have happened where, where it would have been a little, little bit smoother sailing. Yeah. And yeah, we're not trying to scare everybody listening. I mean, but I, it, but it is something to be said that, you know, a lot of times filmmakers, 
I know a lot of them. I, I was one of them. I, I'm, I'm trying to get back into better shape. As you get older, it gets harder and harder. But you, you're you out of shape a lot of times, you know, because mm-hmm. you were watching movies all day on the couch. <laughs> you know, we're vegging on Netflix or we're writing exactly. a screenplay all day or something like that. It's not very physically, you know, uh, exactly. uh, strenuous. So then, you know, when you go out and like, hey, yeah, and you, your mind thinks you're 20. But mm-hmm. your body's like, no, not anymore, and you, not you anymore. have, and you, you're still really out of shape, and it, it really does take a toll on you, especially when you're trying to do these kind of run and gun indie. I'm gonna go steal shots, uh, yes. kind of mentality. It, it and it is, it happened to me on the first one. Like I had to do on on Meg, I literally had to do a, a trek up to the Hollywood side. So I, me and the two actors, that, that my main actress and a friend. I did the hike. I had did the hike like eight years earlier. Yeah, I know that hike. And there's like the horse crap all over the trail. Right, and, and then, the and then there's that steep, yeah. like it's a steep like walk up like towards yeah. the end. It's, it's and like a 40 minute hike. Basically. 40, you're, you're, you're a marathon runner, sir. It took me much longer than that. But, um, <laughs> but I'm carrying the gear with me and I'm just like, you could literally see shots in the movie where I'm like, all right, all right, let's do a shot here. And you can see the camera just like... <laughs> Cause it's just me with the camera. I'm like, I'm trying to hold it together. I have to literally stabilize some of it in, in pose because. Oh so my good. god! But, physically- but you know what? Well, I was gonna. If, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But I was gonna say physically, 100. percent I mean, it's so taxing. But I think even psychologically, when you're done, and this probably applies to to larger scale films as well. But sure. you, your mind is so hyper focused on this one thing. For yeah. even if it's a like a five day shoot, a ten day shoot, whatever it is, like that's all you're living and breathing. Every question you're asked is like, where should the camera go? Where should this mm-hmm. go? And and you're so you know you're you're you're. It's a great energy and it's positive and you're in great spirits, but there's also this vacuum when it's over where like you're physically depleted you're mentally your brain is still at if i don't know if everyone feels like this Mm -hmm. but like i i I feel like my brain is like still on overdrive and the mistakes or the things that you didn't get are starting to set in and the reality of like the post-production mountain you have to climb is setting in so there's this tough period for me at least like in between finishing a crazy shoot like that and then actually shooting the material that is like almost as hard Hard as shooting the movie it's just like getting through the mental barrier of like okay let's let's you know gather like recharge the batteries right now take maybe a couple of weeks away or whatever and then get back into it and especially when it's like someone like yourself or myself where you're editing your own movie and mm-hmm. you're coloring your own movie and you're mm-hmm. doing all like I mean, it's it's a lot to take on. So you gotta, yeah, pace yourself. That's my only advice is like just pace yourself and and know it'll be hard. And if you know it's gonna be hard, it's not as bad. If you think it's gonna be easy, then everything is like, oh my god, this is a problem now. When you know it's gonna be a problem, then at least you're prepared. At least that's how I see it. What I find what I find funny is that this conversation is not turned into a therapy session for indie filmmakers. Like I love it. I love that. It's just like all of a sudden I'm like, and then I had this thing happen to me. Like it's great. I love it. I love it because <laughs> I feel exactly the way you do. And uh, and uh, everyone listening, just bear with us because I think this needs to be said. When you're done with a shoot, I always feel like we're, we're like carnies, like we're we're carnival folk. So you gather this group of unique, interesting people because generally they always are um, interesting people to make this thing. And you do this intense thing, especially in the micro budget where it's intense and fast and it's not like you're sitting on a movie for six months like these big blockbusters. Like you are building this family, but you do it so quickly. It's like going to war almost. Um, and then when yes. you're done, I get to at least go back and you get to go back to go and to post. So then we're still kind of mm-hmm. in it, but you miss that that relationship you just built. And then when yes. the post is over, now you're just like, oh, I want to go back. Like I... You know, shooting yeah. shooting ego and desire at Sundance. I I didn't want it to stop. I only sh- I shot for four days, but I really didn't yeah. want it to stop. It was just so much fun, and that that's why. And I don't know if you've had this experience or not. If you meet someone that you worked with on a crew, especially if you're the director and, and they were working with you, ten years later, and you just find them somewhere, it's like no days have gone by. You're just like, oh, yes. Bob, yeah, 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 what's yeah. up? Oh my god, <laughs> exactly. because you've gone through this kind of thing together. That yes. it's like cathar. I don't know. What do you think? No, I agree because it's so intense that it like 
it burns it in your memory. It's like this thing that happened, you form these relationships and these bonds, even if it's like there's challenges or there's days that aren't as good, like you remember those almost in a positive light um, the as, as the yeah. years go on. Yeah, you forget the stuff that was challenging and it's just, you know, it's like the same when I've gone on, like when I was younger, I went on this this trip when I was like a teenager, it was kind of this organized trip and I, I was on with these people that I'd never met before and I if I see one of them now, like 15 years later, I'll say it's like it's the same thing. It's like I just saw them because you go through this intense experience. And I think going to back to what you said before, you know, about like just the topic that we're on. I think it's so it's great that we're, we're getting into this. And I think it's so important because I think so much online and this applies even to like my website and mm -hmm. so many other websites, like re lots of filmmaking websites that I'm sure people visit that are great resources but they don't always talk about like the actual realities of working mm -hmm. in the business and like mm -hmm. the the sustaining that over a long term which is like yep. n not always that responsible not to share and and I want to do a better job myself of sharing more of that because you know it's easy to tell people as I often do um to just pick up your camera and make a movie it's a lot harder to tell them that like you know, this is, this is going to be, you know, could be very challenging and, and that's okay. But like, you know, that's just, I feel like it's an important conversation. So I appreciate that you bring it up and that you're, you know, engaging on that. Cause you don't hear that that often in the dialogue with indie film or micro budget film. No, because it's not sexy. It's not, it's exactly. much, it's much sexier to talk about the new camera that came out or yeah. the, oh, or yeah, the yeah. new lens that came out or exactly. how, you know, it's even sexier to talk about distribution. Like, you know, yeah. it's not real sexy to talk about like, oh, I just jacked up my back for a month <laughs> because I'm carrying this thing because I'm completely out of shape. <laughs> And I exactly. just like, you know, and like now I'm literally on a couch for a month because I threw my back out really bad. Now I'm in therapy because of exactly. this film I made. That's not sexy, but it, it is reality. And that's what I try to do mm -hmm. with Indie Film Hustle is to kind of, you know, show people the realities of the business. And you do such a great job on your side as well to just tell people like, look. I, my mantra is always this, follow your dream, but don't be an idiot. And that is like yep. my mantra yeah. on, on filmmakers. Like, follow your dream. God bless. Go follow your dream. Yeah. But just don't be an idiot about it. You know, don't, yeah. don't and mortgage by, by your house. Way, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's it's an incredible advice. And, and I, I don't think I, I, I'm sure I said to this, this to you at some point offline, but like going back to the inception of this story and, mm -hmm. and your mantra and your philosophy on everything, like that was really a huge help for me as a filmmaker, because it just so happened that, you know, I, I had it in my mind. To, um, uh, I, I don't know if it was like November or whatever of the year of the year before I shot it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it wasn't until December that I really like committed to doing it. And in that window, I'd been listening to you a lot and it really oh, helped, thanks, um, hearing your story and just your philosophy to kind of reinvigorate. Cause it felt like, you know, I'd been saying that for a long time. I'd been feeling that for a long time, but like there weren't a lot of other voices that were kind of preaching that sort of stuff and doing it in a real way where it's not just like, you know, top seven cameras to buy for your micro budget indie. It was like, <laughs> you know, you would really uh, personalize your, your, um, the lessons that you were sharing with people and your experiences. And like that really resonated with me and I'm sure with many people. So I just want to, you know, give you, you know, oh, props thanks, for man. that because it was, you know, definitely an important part of, of, getting at least getting like committing to doing this film you know so i appreciate uh, i appreciate so. that man i try i try as much as i can and i know i've actually been reached out by a lot of people from the tribe um that they said like i was making my movie the same time you were making your first movie and i was li every like mm -hmm. every day i would listen to you and your journey while i was making my movie so i felt like we were making our movies together even though we weren't Literally making them exactly. together, and and I've heard that happen with a lot of people who kind of go back to those those early podcasts of me talking about Meg and how I made that little film, and you know it's 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 it's, it's exciting, man. I just try to share as much as I possibly can because I I think yeah. there is a lack. I think you do fit a really great hole uh, in the space as well, where there aren't a lot of people talking about the truth. There's a lot of mm -hmm. fluff. There's a lot of you know top like you said top seven cameras to shoot your. Your, you know, DSLRs yeah, yeah. or what's the best way to, you know, this or that. And, you know, there's an element of, of, of that kind of stuff on, on, on my site, but the majority, Same, yeah. but the majority of it is the truth. Like, and that's when I interview people like yourself or other guests, I go deep into like, so what were you feeling? Like anytime I have a Sundance mm -hmm. winner on, I'm yeah. like, so what was it like when you got the call? 
Like what? Yeah, yeah, what yeah, was yeah. that time like? like I love I, that. I want to know because I've never gotten the call myself. <laughs> no, well, and what I love about how you do that is, um, like, just to throw a, a reference in here, unrelated to filmmaking, but I, I'm a huge fan of Howard Stern's interviews. He, yeah. I don't know if you listen to him at all. He does terrible, like yeah. the best celebrity interviews, and they're great because it's not just what's your project coming out like, you know, <laughs> what some fluffy stories. It's like you know, talking about the nitty gritty of like the emotional components of it or the psychological components or like the realities that like aren't always talked about, but are actually underlying impetus for things that happen or get made or that are, you know, it's just important. So yeah, again, I think, I think you've done an amazing job and that's so nice to hear that other, so many other filmmakers unsurprisingly um, have been inspired by what you're doing. And, and I know that's a gratifying feeling. I'll get that sometimes from my blog where, you know, someone will say, Hey, I made this film and you know, I was cause of this article or that podcast or whatever. And it's, it's, it's nice because you know, it's not just for, for nothing, you know, it's not right. just about making a living doing it or whatever. It's like, it's, it's a, that's the best part. So anyway, lots of that. And yeah, I, I get lots of compliments on, on your site from tons of people that read mine as well. Thanks, man. It's um, and the other thing is, and I and I want everybody to hear this. I've said this a bunch of times, but I want everyone to hear this again. Is you have no idea what impact your work will do on other people in the world, mm -hmm. whether that be a podcast, whether that be an article, or even more so your art, your actual films that you make. Even if it's a little short film you put up on YouTube, you have no idea what that impact will have on a certain person at a certain time in their life. You always have to think that way when you make art. Because I've mm -hmm. watched things. I mean, look, we all read the book Rebel Without a Crew, like Robert Rodriguez's yep. amazing book. That book, how many careers did that book launch? How yeah. many book careers is that book still launching to this day? It's like one of those mythological texts in yep. in our business, especially for my generation. What I was I was there at the time that it was happening, um, and you know, you've no idea the impact that those little 10 minute film schools he put on his DVDs did for me back in the day. Like they're yeah. so huge to him. He's just like, Oh, I'm just going to do this and throw it out there. But you just don't know what it does to people. And I've realized that doing indie film hustle over the years. But, but again, people watch certain movies and have an emotional attachment or an emotional cue from it that I never intended, but to them it yeah. makes sense. So it's, it's really important what we do. And yeah, look, we're not, true. we're not solving. Look, we're not, heroes we're not you know fighting forest fires we're not saving you know you know saving people from cancer but yeah. it is still important in the human condition in the human experiment yeah in many ways and when you have any platform whether it's like the movie you're making whether it's a, a blog whatever your, your podcast like you have a responsibility because people listen they believe it they buy into it and and you're like by default an authority on the topic and and you know it, it comes with a lot of responsibility even if it's a uh small audience like when i had when i was starting my blog and i'd have you know a hundred people a month like the first month or whatever like it was it was just building but i still felt like you know what that's still a hundred people that's still a hundred human beings like what if one of them right. takes what i say the wrong way and, and does something stupid like i always had that in my head i feel like you you certainly do as well with with your content so and yeah, I think it's important and it definitely transcends, as you said, to just the movies you're making, the stories, the themes, um, the messages that are in your film. Like it's amazing how much uh, and it's it's inspiring now how much these like smaller micro budget films even uh, that like, yeah, they may not get a big theatrical re release. They may not show in the, the dome in Hollywood, but someone may see it and it may like save their life like it may not to like glorify but it may there may be something that you touch on that really resonates with somebody mm -hmm. and it may it, it may does. help them you know so yeah so i i couldn't agree more let's talk about distribution definitely all right so distribution for us was something from the very beginning we thought about doing and wanting to go down the self-distribution path specifically just because it was such an experiment in this movie uh as we already talked about it was like no budget very small crew um and it was it was just this idea of like can we do this thing where we make it fully in-house and ha and distribute it and even though it's going to be a small project a small distribution um if it's all in house, like, is there some sort of financial model where that actually makes sense, where you can make a movie for $10,000, $12,000 and actually turn a profit with it? And the only way that I 
felt like that made any sense was through self distribution. Um, with that said, um, a few months into the process, once well, more than a few months once we were done editing, uh, I got. Uh, a couple of offers from distributors and we got a lot more later once we started doing like festival stuff, but we had a couple right off the bat. Um, one of which was really enticing. It was a distributor um, that uh, essentially wanted to retro finance the film. So they would have technically then become a producer on the project. They would have just paid everything. They would have reimbursed me for everything I paid. Um, and then they would have essentially come on board as, as, as an equal partner. Um, and that's something I hadn't really heard of. And I thought, yeah, you know what, that's it's rare, but it happens. Exactly. And, and for, for me, I was like, okay, I hear all these stories about people making $10,000 movies and it's flushed down the toilet. Um, if we get anything, we're lucky at the same time, it was so early and we hadn't premiered yet or anything. So I, I kind of put a pin in that. Um, we ended up, uh, premiering here in LA at dances with films, which is, which is awesome. They got, um, you know, I, I guess they have a lot of distributors on their radar because once we got in, like before they even, we even premiered it, um, we started getting emails, uh, from all these distributors and I wrote again, another article on this on my website. There's about 40 of them in total that we engaged with either sales agents or distributors. Um, and I went through one by one and vetted them and spoke to a lot of them on the phone or just, you know, had meetings or whatever. And it was just so clear that that was not right for this movie like and it wasn't just a financial thing it, but that was a big part of it um for anyone listening that hasn't gone down that path most distribution companies are are um on this level are not i i, I don't want to say they're not legitimate but they're not the 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 deck is sort of stacked in their favor um you might get a deal or an offer where they'll pack it, distribute your film, but it's really being packaged with a bunch of other films. It could get held up, you know, going from film market to film market for, you know, who knows how long, maybe it'll get sold. Maybe it won't, maybe someone will see it. Maybe they, um, and it's just, it's such a, a gamble. And even the best case scenario is that like, you're going to make, you know, a, a small amount of money back unless you have name actors or mm -hmm. if you have some you know, festival prestige, you premiered at Sundance or something. But for the most part, like at least the distributors I spoke with um, and, and again, some of them are quite reputable. The deals just weren't it wasn't enticing. It wasn't anything where what I are, wasn't. What are some of the deals? I mean, interrupt you. Well, like, what are some of the deals that you can say, like, you know, percentages and caps and all that kind of stuff? So people understand what these deals for are sure. like. So I think standard when it comes to percentage is usually around anywhere from like 25 to 35% is kind of like the standard depending on how involved they are and like what the marketing is going to look like and all of that. Um, and honestly, upfront, like usually what I would be looking for if, if I don't, um, if I'm not sold on the fact that they're going to really be able to get this to market or get this into the world in the next six months, year, <clears throat> what I'm looking for is some sort of minimum guarantee. I don't expect the world. I know what the film is. I know it's low budget and there's no stars. Um, but if, you know, if someone came along and offered us a, a distribution deal where they were going to take 30% and they were going to give us uh, an MG up front that would cover a good chunk of our budget, like whether it's you know, seven grand, eight grand, something like that. Uh, and I liked working with them. I would certainly consider it, but we didn't have that right combination. We had some people offering us money, but they didn't have a good track record. We had other people offering us no money, but they had a pretty good track record. Um, but it was, it just didn't feel thematically like the film would be necessarily a good fit for them. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm crunching the numbers and I've, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience marketing things online, selling products through my website. Um, I understand uh, on a basic level e-commerce and I just fit, my gut feeling was just like, this is a, if any film is going to be self-distributed right. is this film. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We went through distributors. I know you did with your mm -hmm. film. Um, we had, uh, it was, it was such an easy process other than actually giving them the film and the artwork, which is already made. All we needed were closed captions. Uh, we got those through rev.com, Rev. sure. which is like crazy how that system works. It's a whole <laughs> other conversation. Um, <laughs> And, um, and yeah, and, and then, you know, now it's getting into, so we did pre-orders. I'm not sure if you want to jump ahead there yeah, yet, but yeah. that's something. So I think that's something really important to understand. It's something that I've, I've learned from other people in the business as far as how, 
um, pre-orders can really boost your sales on day one. And the goal is that basically uh, all your pre-orders convert to a sale on day one. So if you have 30 day window and every day, you know, you get whatever, 10 people and that becomes uh, 300, you know, you get 300 pre-orders on day one. It looks to iTunes from what I'm told, like 300 people bought your movie that day that helps shoot it up in the rankings. Right. And so so that was the strategy and I didn't use any paid ads. I didn't, you know, I, I used basically like the resources I had, which are my blog, um, my, some of my cast, like mm -hmm. the lead actress helped. She, she, you know, she has a bit of a following for some music stuff she's doing. So we promoted it the best we could. We got a bunch of pre-orders. We hit the top, like within two days we were on, uh, the top pre-order list, like relatively high up. I was, I, I, I went on there honestly, like two days into it just to see who was on, like they have on iTunes, like the top pre-order yeah, yeah. category. I thought, okay, like I'm not going to see the movie on here. No way yet, but like, let's just see. And then sure enough, like I'm going through and a movie I just saw blaze, um, with Ethan Hawke, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, or that he directed, which was awesome, um, was on there. And we were like above we were like ranking before that and, and it was, it didn't stay like that for the whole time, but it was like that for like a week. And that was the first point when I realized like it actually, the playing field really is leveled once you're dealing with iTunes, you still, you know, you're still up against a, a big competition where you're looking at like studio features and all of that with all these marketing dollars, but you can compete, like you can compete in certain categories. And one thing that I haven't done yet, but we plan to do, it's just been a challenge because, um, the other feature is, is just abandoning so much of my time right now is, um, we're working on cutting trailers specific for Facebook. So mm -hmm. we're going to cut these, um, square trailers mm -hmm. and they're going to have captions and they're going to be like 15 to 30 seconds. And we're going to market them to people that are interested in, um, similar films to ours, but that are also interested in like, um, things like Kickstarter or seed and spark or Vimeo or like just people that might be into that indie film world, whether mm -hmm. they're a filmmaker or not. And we're going to use Facebook ads to target them. And I'm going to use a lot of what I've learned from Facebook ads in the past, just from other products I've sold and all that to apply to that. Um, in an ideal world, that would have rolled out like day one. Like we launched, we're on iTunes and that rolled out. That was actually my plan. It didn't work out that way because just w my timeline just went absolutely haywire on mm -hmm. my new project. But that's that's the strategy. And so far, we're recouping the budget. I'm checking, you know, Distriber every day. There's more sales. There's more rentals. And it's really an amazing feeling to know that we just have control over what's happening. Um, so it's been really great so far. And in the future, we're going to obviously open up the door for other uh, platform. So typically, um, and I'm sure you've talked about this in other episodes, but for anyone that's not as familiar with windowing, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously with a theatrical film, you window the film in the theater and then, you know, wait a couple months and then it's released on DVD or whatever. Um, with digital, you can do your own windowing strategy. So you always want to do iTunes first or, uh, transactional VOD, whether it's, Am um, you know, iTunes, uh, I guess Amazon has their own version. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also have like the other, other subscription platform as well. Um, but then you go to like subscription and then, which is, you know, Hulu or whatever. And then you can go to like ad based, which is also, um, yeah, AVOD is a turn on another, yeah. another big way of making money now. Exactly. And the, some of those platforms are actually really good. Oh um, yeah. Like, I, I know people making yeah. four or five grand a month off of AVOD. Yeah. Cause there's not the same movies on there. So like on Netflix or something, you're competing with the la whatever Adam Sandler movie they made that month, right. but on you're on like, you know, uh, a two B TV or, or one of these platforms that like you maybe never heard of, but people are actually on there renting movies and there's not as much competition. So anyway, you kind of want to window it. So you're going from like transact transactional to SVO to, AVOD you know, AVOD, exactly as, as I don't have to tell you, but, um, but yeah, so that's kind of where we're at with it right now. Nice. And, and it's, it's exciting just to see it all finished. This is the first time I've taken it to that point. So it's, it's definitely a nice experience. Now, and I've spoken a lot about self-distribution. I'm a big proponent of self-distribution, but I also want people to understand that it is not for everybody and for every film. You know, for a micro budget uh, like yours and like my films, it makes sense. You know, and we also mm -hmm. have an audience. We have a platform. We're savvy about marketing. We're savvy about 
how you know to sell products online. So it makes sense for you know, look, if you came to me, and go, Alex, what should I do? I'm like, dude, you should self distribute. It makes unless you get some sick deal, it yeah. makes all the sense in the world. But if you have a movie that costs you three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, self distributions are much tougher sell. Yeah, I think the only situation where that that can work is um, is when you have some sort of if there's no stars in it or anything, if you have some wind in your sails as far as um, a, a built in fan base, if it's, right. let's say, on a topic or it wins, you know, a top prize at Berlin or something, there's some and at that point you're getting offers anyway. But but when you when you already have this like huge momentum and you have a way to ride that um it works. I, 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 that's the only time it could work. But otherwise, I totally agree with you because you know you spend all this money and and you're not. I mean, the thing is, if me or you makes a movie for ten grand and we make fifty grand on it, like that's we're, we're good. We're fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I'll do. It's like, let's rinse and repeat that four or five times a year. We're we're in good shape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because in theory, with the right script, you're shooting something in a week or two weeks or less. Sure. And post is about a month. Yeah. Posting it in a month. And you could do a couple of those a year. You could be making, in theory, with the right marketing strategy, with the right topics, with a good trailer, understanding how to market. If you're really savvy with that, you can make a living. And I'm at the very, very beginning of that experiment, but I'm seeing it already start to pay off. I'm literally seeing the money. Uh, come in and and you know uh, is uh, not not uh, getting rich with them certainly making a lot more of my income from my my traditional revenue streams with my commercial production all that but understanding how that works is so important to me right now so I can scale it up so I can apply it to other projects mm-hmm. and, and and I do think there's a breaking point where you can scale it up so far but at a certain point, at least right now, it doesn't make sense if your budget's too high. Uh, you need someone to come in and just say, "Okay." You made that film for half a million. Great, we're gonna buy for a million, and they cut you a check. I mean, that's the dream for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, the beautiful thing about these little films, these ten thousand dollar, twenty thousand dollar movies, is like you can make some money with them, you know. And and uh, if you know what you're doing, it's just yeah. Not everyone wants to put in the work as a marketer, which is the which is the big question. It's a dirty you know? word, but it's a word that we all need to understand um, yes. without question. Now, can you tell me a little bit uh, quickly about your film, your new film? Yes, the new film. Yes. So the new film I'm super excited about is called White Crow. Um, it's about a woman who gets a heart transplant and then she starts taking on the characteristics of her heart donor. Um, so it's based on this very uh, real thing. Um, and, and some people would call it real, some not, but it's, it's called cellular memory. And it happens when people get a new organ and there's like certain uh, side effects that sort of um, uh, they, they experience as a result of the surgery and as a result of, you know, feeling this sort of bizarre connection almost to the other person. So it started as like that idea. It turned into a genre film. It's not it's not I wouldn't call it a horror film. Um, it's kind of like a, a creeper, like it's a slow burn kind of psychological thriller with maybe some hints of horror. And it's all about this woman realizing the person she's sort of becoming mentally and and, you know, psychologically in her personality um, is maybe not a, a great person. And she develops this relationship with her widow. And there's it's just such I, I think it's so awesome, fascinating. Man, it sounds I, fantastic. Yeah, it's really, really I mean, we've had a lot of people read it and give us great feedback. It's been something I've like toiled over for uh, a year basically on the script, which I've never done. Um, And yeah, so we did um, funding. I'm funding most of it myself. We did a crowdfunding on Seed and Spark. We raised um, like just under 15K, uh, uh, which was a nice like extra boot for us. And then we also got, uh, I was telling you offline, but we got to pitch to the Duplass brothers. So they sent them the script. They put a little bit of money as like a grant basically into the movie, which is just like such a, a great confidence boost for all of us. We're super grateful for that. And um, now we're, we're getting ready to shoot. We're shooting in two weeks, uh, oh, shooting wow. on, um, yeah, it's crazy. It's been in the work. This one's not as crazy as the last. So in terms of the, the, I learned my lesson. So we've got two locations. They're both booked. They're both, we have permission for both. We're not breaking into any houses. 
<laughs> oh, what's the yeah. fun? I mean, come on. Well, you we, gotta, we have a couple, look, Hitchcock yeah, we, stole shots. Like he was on studio movies. He would just grab a camera and run down the street and shoot some stuff. Oh, oh, trust me. No, you're <laughs> preaching in the choir. I've got we've got a few of those in there, but most of it we're 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 gonna be legit for. And um and yeah, we've got a bigger crew. We're shooting Alexa. Like it's gonna be treated nice. more like nice. a, a full um, production, but you know, it's kind of in between like what I did last time and, and what you might see on like your average quarter million dollar, half million dollar, like indie film. So it's going to be nice to have like a bit more of a infrastructure. So anyway, I'm doing lots of that. If anyone wants to, um, see it, I know I listen to your podcast, so I know you do your plugs sometimes at the end, um, but I'll, I'll mention. Um, so, uh, we're on, and there's not a ton on there yet, but we're going to be rolling out loads of behind the scenes content on um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's just White Crow Movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot coming on that front if anyone wants to follow along. Cool. Yep. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you the questions I ask every guest. I think you might know these questions at this point. I do. I didn't think to prepare them, though, but <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, okay. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Um... Let me think about that, because the first thing that comes to mind is is what everybody would say, which is just go and make your own movies. Um, the 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 longer answer to that, I think, is understand um, understand story and understand character, because I think a lot of filmmakers and and I fell into this boat. Like it's so easy to get wrapped up in the gear, and it's so easy to think if you get the right camera, it's you're going to be a professional. But the hard part that just there's no getting around. There's no way you can buy yourself out of it is like read a lot of scripts, understand writing, even if you don't want to be a screenwriter, like understand what it takes to tell a good story, because that's something that you can't buy and that you you can't learn other than just doing it. So um, so and you don't need to even that doesn't have to cost you any money, you know, to spend time writing or reading scripts. That's the but for me been the most beneficial thing. So Very hopefully cool. that that resonates with somebody. Uh, Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Um, Yes, I think, okay, the biggest book that, uh, I'm gonna say two, so uh, I have to say Mariachi, El Mariachi, because that just blew blew me away. Rebel Um, Without a Crew, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for sure. As far as, honestly, business is concerned, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is the best book I've ever read. Great book, great, great book. That book literally changed my life. And to sum it up for people in one sentence, it's basically all about how you understand how you make a living and how um, a lot of us think about making a living based on essentially trading our time for money and, you know, just getting paycheck. And that's how we make our income. And this book's all about, like, how do you create valuable assets that will pay you so you can eventually make passive income and have free time to do things like make movies? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's the furthest thing from a film book, but it is. It, it literally changed my life from the day I read it on. So I, I, I have to have to mention it. On great that book. Question. Great book. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, I think it's honestly in, in the film industry. I don't know if it took me the longest to learn, but the most important and probably it took me a long time was how to really be collaborative in the truest sense. Um, and I think I learned this a lot when I was writing my script this year. This is by far the script I'm most proud of. It's also the one I was open most to notes on. I sent it to so many people, got so much feedback. I wasn't offended at the feedback. You know, I wasn't mm-hmm. sensitive. It was like, these are people that might watch the movie. Don't screw it up by the time they actually can, like, don't screw it up on set, screw it up now and, and <laughs> learn from those mistakes and be collaborative. Other people have other things to offer. And as the director, your job is, in my opinion, is you're, you're the filter. As the writer, you're the filter. You take the good ideas that make sense for that story. But if there's a good idea coming from your PA or coming from uh, uh, you know whoever, it doesn't matter, um, be open and receptive to it. Because I think without good collaboration, um, it, you just, you, you don't have anything really. So, yeah. And what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh God, I hate this question. Um, <laughs> whatever comes to mind, whatever comes to okay, mind. Okay. So I'll say, um, this is a recent favorite film, but it's been a huge inspiration for my movie right now, which is Persona by Ingmar Bergman. Okay. Um, I just, I, I, I absolutely love that movie. Um, one of, I'll give you my three favorite films like I've seen this year. Um, so that's one of them. 
and not recent movies necessarily. Uh, the other one would be A Woman Under the Influence, yeah, John Cassavetes. Of course, of course. It's just like, it, it's just such, oh my God. Raw. I can't, it's I, a raw nerve. Yeah. It's a raw nerve, is what it is. It, it, it really, really is. Um, and my dog's barking, so I guess I got to go to the third one. Um, <laughs> the third one would probably be. Um, Something by Aronofsky, maybe The Wrestler. Uh, that movie, movie is just oh. so raw and simple and pure, and it just blows my mind. I could watch that movie every day, and there's very few movies. I'm not into wrestling. I'm not no, into... No, yeah, right, 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 right. You know what I mean? It's just like, I just, it, it's, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's a, it's a masterpiece, I think. So those would be my three right now, and that'll change tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, where can people find you in the work you do? So my main blog is sort of my hub for everything. So Noam Kroll, N-O-A-M-K-R-O-L-L.com. That's got all my stuff is sort of on there. I've got a podcast, which you've been on, which people should listen to that. People, everyone tells me how much they love that episode. It's a show don't tell on iTunes. And then, um, like I said, White Crow, White Crow movie is the handle on all social media. So And And the name of the movie we're discussing is? Shadows on the Road, um, which I should also promote as well. <laughs> uh, promoting everything but that right now. So that's on iTunes if anyone wants to to watch that. Um, look up Shadows on the Road. At some point, we're going to be doing like Vimeo on Demand and some other platforms for people that aren't in the U.S. or right. Canada. Because right. uh, that's the only where it is right now. But yeah, Shadows on the Road. You can see the trailer on my website and on Vimeo and stuff as you Google it. So, yeah, I think that covers it. Man, no, thank you so much for being on the show. I'll put all those links in the show notes, guys. Thanks again for being on it. It is a pleasure talking to a fellow fellow indie film hustler because you are an indie film hustler without question, oh, yeah. man. So thanks again for being on the show, brother. Thanks for dropping the thank bombs. Thank you so much. 